Welcome to A Well Cared For Human, the podcast that tries to convince you that you are 100% normal and an even better than okay example of the human species, despite the fact that sometimes we feel like the craziest, most incapable, or worthless creatures on the face of this planet. I'm Corey, an author, a creative, and the host of the show. Whatever you're bringing to the table today, I hope this episode proves to be a dose of inspiration for you on your quest to become a well-cared-for human. You can find the episode show notes, your free wellness blueprint, and more at awellcaredforhuman.com. And as always, thank you for listening. Hello humans, it's your host Corey back with this week's episode of A Well-Cared-For Human. Last week, I talked about friendships and the reasons why sometimes they end, and how ending those friendships can even be the healthiest, most loving thing we do, not just for ourselves, but also for the other person. This week, I want to talk about fear. And before you nope out of this conversation, let me remind you that fear is something that even the bravest people on the planet experience. In fact, I would argue that if you are a very brave person, then you've encountered a lot of fear. You cannot develop bravery in the absence of fear. They are deeply entwined. So if you admire brave people, and I certainly do, then you admire people who have learned how to work with their fear. In my case, I've often been called brave by friends, but also by people who have never met me, which I find hilarious because I feel like I'm the biggest coward I know. For the longest time, I thought, oh, people are just saying that because I've tricked them. I put up a really strong front, and it gives people the illusion that nothing rattles me. Or maybe what they see is my trauma conditioning. So if something awful happens, like my mother is assaulted, or someone goes to jail, or I roll my car three times in a ditch, or a spider goes into my mouth, all of these terrible things have happened to me, then they're like, oh wow, she's super calm. But I only appear calm because I've been repeatedly exposed to upheaval and chaos and violence. And I learned how to become really calm in dangerous or difficult situations because when I was younger, everyone else was losing their minds around me. And if I lost my mind too, and there was no one to look after me, then I wouldn't be safe. So it was a skill I developed out of necessity. So for a long time, I believed, no, there's no way I could be a brave person because I'm scared all the time. It wasn't until much later that I realized, actually, I am pretty brave, and I do consistently confront my fears. Turns out that the previous narratives I had about myself were inaccurate, and it was just my insecurity talking. You can, in fact, be shaking in your boots, ready to poop yourself, stress sweating, and still show up and do the thing, whatever the thing is. And that's exactly what bravery looks like. But before I get too far ahead of myself, and before I make it sound like I'm advocating that you should stress yourself out or even re-traumatize yourself just for the sake of being, quote, fearless, let me talk about why there is no shame when you aren't ready to do something. Overcoming fear is not about being hard on yourself. Doing what you're afraid of should not feel like a punishment. Instead, I only confront fear when it's productive when it's fear that stands in between me and something I care about or a result that I want. I don't shove or push myself towards fear just for the hell of it. And here's an example of what I mean. When I was 15 and learning how to drive, which is a common rite of passage here in the U.S., something awful happened. At the time, my dad drove a very large truck. I don't know if you know what a two-ton dually is, but just imagine a very large pickup truck. They're so big that they have extra tires in the back, so four rear tires instead of two. And mind you that at the time I'm about five foot tall, a hundred pounds when this happens. I can't even really see over the steering wheel. I think he even puts a phone book under me to prop me up. I don't remember exactly how we solved that problem, but I do remember him asking me if I wanted to practice driving. And of course I said yes and was super excited. And I hop behind the steering wheel and I'm pumped and I'm ready to go. And he says, okay, back up. And I look at the steering wheel. I look at the controls and they mean nothing to me. I've never driven a car before, let alone this huge truck. And so he says, back up the truck. And I say, I don't know how. That's it. That's all I said. I don't know how. Well, apparently that was the wrong thing to say because he starts screaming at me, telling me I'm stupid, that I'm an idiot, that I don't know how to do anything. And he keeps going on like this. 
really cutting me down until I'm crying and I'm so humiliated and embarrassed because it's not just the two of us in the truck. There are these other guys that work for him in the cab with us. And so just because I don't know how to automatically back up the truck, he throws his door open, he comes around to the driver's side, and he yanks me out from behind the wheel. And that was it. That was the whole lesson. And the only real takeaway that I had from this horrible experience was a deeply entrenched fear of learning anything new. Anything skill-based, where you have to know how to do something, or especially if you have an audience, someone watching you, or if you have to ask someone to explain something to you, or to get someone to teach you something. In any of these scenarios, I will immediately get sick to my stomach, I'll feel like I want to cry, my heart will pound, I won't be able to think very well, and I'll start sweating. And sometimes I'll get bitchy or angry, and I'll be like, I don't want to do this, or it's dumb, or never mind which is just me trying to hide the fact of how scared I am at that moment. And what I'm scared of is what I call beginner energy, because it's a vibe, right? Being a beginner, not knowing anything, having to let someone else guide you, to talk you through it, to teach you, it's a very vulnerable position. And I always feel really small when I'm in this space. And my difficulties with this kind of situation boils down to the fact that anytime I encounter this beginner energy, I also encounter tremendous fear. And this is really problematic because life is full of beginner moments, absolutely brimming with them. And for the longest time, I thought I hated trying new things. I thought I hated learning stuff because this experience was so negative for me. It took a really long time for me to realize I actually really like new stuff. I love learning new things. I'm a curious person. I like accumulating skills and knowledge. Which, just as a side note, this is great proof that you may not have any idea of who you really are and what you really like because the coping mechanisms that we develop when we're trying to survive trauma or difficult situations often masks our true nature. We can't be ourselves and survive. But that feels like a whole other episode, so let me just stick with fear today. And I'll just say that over time, I realized I really do like learning. I like learning languages. I like learning art skills, how to draw, how to paint. I really like physical stuff, like weightlifting, physical challenges, tools. This year alone, I've gained some plumbing skills, and Kim and I just built this six-foot-tall privacy fence with a bunch of tools we rented from Home Depot. I do not recommend digging, though. (laughs) That is a skill I could have passed on. Zero out of ten, do not recommend. But in short, I don't know if it's just because I'm human or if it's especially true because I'm a writer and writers love new experiences. We just like to do stuff and to take it in and imagine where these kind of moments fit into a variety of lives. But whatever it is, because of my upbringing, instead of me just throwing myself into something new and enjoying it and playing and having fun and being excited that I get to do a new thing, what I usually experience instead is a massive wave of fear. Endless thought spirals about how stupid I am or incapable I am or worthless I am as a human will come up. And I'll experience the terrible physical symptoms I described earlier the pounding heart, the sweating, the upset stomach. And I want to be clear, fear is important. Fear is meant to keep us safe. It's why we experience it. It's good to be afraid of the giant jaguar that might jump on your back, crack open your skull, and eat your guts. You know, fear is good. It's useful. But fear can get confused sometimes. It can tell you something is unsafe just because your heart was broken or you were humiliated or abandoned. Because fear doesn't just log our physical threats, it's also keeping track of all the psychological, emotional, and spiritual threats anytime we encounter something that feels even a little bit like danger. Fear comes in and says, no, 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 let me tell you why this is a bad idea and why we shouldn't do it. So what do we do when fear comes up? If you're going to be trying to heal yourself, if you're going to be trying to move towards becoming a well-cared-for human, you're going to experience fear. So what do you do when fear happens? What can we do about it? Personally, I try to see fearful moments not only as an opportunity to build courage, but also to develop my intuition and to practice self-love. For example, I've just started learning Spanish. I studied French for many years. I have a teacher who I worked with for about eight years at this point. And we speak for an hour every week or so. And my French is not perfect, even a little bit, but it's passable. And I continue with my lessons because my ultimate goal is to be an impressive polyglot who's fluent in six or seven languages by the time I'm in my 60s and ready to 
travel the world full time. And I'll be 39 in August, so I figured that it was time to get going on my third language if I hope to, you know, pick up all the other ones I want to learn. And Spanish is a good bridge between French and some of the other languages that I want to pick up. So learning a new language is full of beginner energy, right? When someone talks to me and I can't string together two words, I'm going to feel stupid like a complete and total moron every time I have one of these lessons. It's true that these Spanish lessons only last for 30 minutes, once a week, but you would think that I am being tortured with bamboo shoes under my nails every Thursday. So where does the courage come in, or rather why I see this as an opportunity to experience courage, is because I can be proud of myself for showing up, even though I was terrified to do so. I will not die if this person I've met three times thinks I'm a moron. I won't actually lose an eye or an arm if I struggle through a 30-minute Spanish lesson. It will feel hard, and it will feel terrible, but I will not actually perish. So it's a safe way to experience fear, to get comfortable with fear, to wear my fears out. And when I do something scary, but I survive it, right, I don't mean surviving an abusive situation. I'm talking about doing things that are scary, but relatively safe. And when I pull through those moments, I have more confidence in myself and my abilities. The same for self-love. I can be proud of myself. I can reward myself for showing up even though I didn't want to. I can say kind and affirming things to myself. Like, look at you, Corey, you were terrified, but you did it and you didn't even poop yourself the entire lesson. Excellent job. Confronting fears also comes with this built-in opportunity to undo negative conditioning. For example, because when I try new things, I often hear my father's voice saying, you're stupid, you can't do anything, you're never going to do anything right. And this is my chance to be like, clearly you are wrong, sir, because only one of us can speak a word of Spanish and no eres tu, right? (laughs) But confronting fear isn't just great for building courage and confidence or talking sense to those destructive thought patterns and being kind to yourself or practicing self-love, which is already a whole lot of benefits, in addition to the new skill or experience that you get to have. It also develops an absolutely essential and amazing skill that pushes us toward wellness, and that's developing a strong connection to our intuition. Depending on what kind of experiences you've had or trauma you've endured, your intuition may be more or less intact. For me, because I was raised by a narcissistic parent, my intuition took major damage. I talk about this back in episode 11, as to why I struggled so badly with trusting myself for so long, with believing in myself, and there's some connection to fear here. It's a little hard to explain exactly because there is a tremendous subtlety, at least in my experience, between the fear that accompanies destructive thoughts, thoughts like, I'll never be okay, they're right about me, I'm worthless, I'm weak, I can't do this, and the fear that accompanies positive thoughts, I can and I will heal, I can do this. Positive, loving thoughts feel just as scary, sometimes more scary, actually. And my body registers the experience of fear the same regardless of whether or not it's good fear or bad fear. And I'm using quotes around each of those words. Good fear, bad fear. You can just imagine the air quotes. And I think that's because good fear is new for most of us. It's uncertain. It's walking into the unknown in a lot of ways. We know what trauma or bad fear looks like, what it feels like. But we don't know what health looks like necessarily. And that can be really terrifying. But if we continue to approach our fears, if we continue to look at our fears, we gain this opportunity to develop our intuition and to get to a place where we can ask clarifying questions like, am I afraid of this or am I actually excited for this? Am I feeling terror right now or am I feeling anticipation? And for a long, long time, my gauge simply registered fear. It was all fear, up and down the board, fear, fear, fear. And the problem with this is that it means I'm also terrified of things that are 100% good for me. For example, there's a book, a series of books, actually, that I really, really want to write. But I haven't started them. I haven't tackled it because I care so much about the topic. And if the book doesn't do well, I'm scared I'll feel like I failed and it'll just be horrible and I'll never forgive myself for ruining something so important to me. So I keep putting off writing it, and instead I keep writing books in the series that already are doing well, that people are asking for, that I know people want to read. In that sense, I'm playing it safe. 
I'm also terrified of the doctor and the idea that one day I'm going to go into her office and she'll tell me I have some incurable disease. But of course, the only way to identify something early and get good treatment is, wait for it, go to the doctor. So in both of these instances, fear is a hindrance, not a help. This kind of fear is standing between me and something I want or need, something that would lead me toward health and freedom and self-respect. It's not the kind of fear that keeps me safe. Instead, it's keeping me from moving forward. It's a subtle distinction, but it makes a big difference. That said, I do have a few tricks that I use to try and clarify if my fear is helpful or not. These usually help me distinguish if my fear is good fear, fear that keeps me safe, or bad fear, fear that keeps me from happiness, wellness, or doing the things I want to do with my life. Number one, the first, is how do I feel after I do the thing? How do I feel after is a good indicator if it's a good or bad fear. If I feel good after, then I should continue with the activity. For example, I never wanted to go to the dojo. I studied Wei Chi Ru for many years. I did not matter how many times a week that I went to the dojo. I always showed up with knots in my stomach and sweaty palms at the idea of fighting someone. But after every class, an hour and a half later, I would always feel amazing, and I would be so glad that I went. And it was like the stress and pain of forcing myself to go was completely erased. So I kept going. I just kept going all the way from a white belt to a black belt. I just kept showing up, even though I never wanted to go before the start of each class. Because how you feel after not before is what matters. That is a more accurate gauge of whether or not your actions are healthy if they're serving you. So ask yourself how you feel after you do something. And if you feel good afterwards, then you're on the right track. Keep doing whatever that is. Number two is pay attention to what you're saying about the activity. So in your head, when you're thinking about your option, your choice, are you complaining about you, yourself, or are you complaining about the activity? For me, when I'm wrapped up in bad fear, useless fear, unhelpful fear, I attack myself. I drag out all of my flaws, my imperfections, all the reasons why I should not do the thing. That's different than, I probably shouldn't swim in this dark water because there are snakes here. (laughs) The focus in this example is on the snakes. That's a sound, rational fear. So if I'm giving myself a hard time, if I'm treating myself like I'm the problem, that might be a clue that I'm holding myself back for some reason I don't fully understand yet. Like my lesson with my dad and my fear of trying new things, there's probably some experience or memory or history there that's coming up for me when I enter this new situation. And I could always try it once if it's not physically threatening, you know, if it's not something that's going to cost me life or limb. I can try it and see how I feel afterwards. And if I feel good afterwards, then I'm like, okay, that was something I should keep doing. But in general, part of my self-love practice is I try not to believe any of the bullshit my trauma says about me. So if the narrative is, I can't do this, I'm too dumb, I'm too weak, people will think I'm a big old nerd for liking this, whatever. If the focus is on me and not the thing, it's almost always fear talking, not my intuition. When your intuition tells you not to do something, it will never attack you. Your intuition is Team You. My intuition is Team Corey, so it's never going to list my flaws or my ineptitudes in a situation. The voice of intuition, that inner voice, is a positive force in our lives. It will never go against you or lead you astray. It never feels forced or rushed or desperate. Our only problem is that sometimes we think we're listening to our intuition, but what we're actually listening to is our fear. But again, if you're stuck and it's not clear if it's the voice of intuition or the voice of fear you're listening to, you could always ask yourself some clarifying questions. And as you continue to gently move the dial toward health, fear is going to come up. That's normal. That's natural. It doesn't mean you're doing anything wrong. It just means that you're alive and that you will experience fear sometimes because you have a body. And fear is something that comes with the having a body package. And if you want to be a well-cared-for human, keep working with your fears. Keep trying to understand them through meditations like Tonglin which I covered in the meditation episode, episode two. Or you can try journaling to comb through your experiences, like the driving lesson I had with my father. You could journal it out, revisit that moment so you can better understand why certain things scare you, what happened, how those fears might be manifesting in your present reality, not just in your past. That way you can talk some sense to yourself when fear gets a hold of you. 
you would be able to say something like, I feel this way because X, Y, or Z happened. But just because it happened then, it doesn't mean that it's going to happen again now. You can bring a lot of gentleness and kindness to those conversations with yourself. This might also be a great opportunity to take inventory of your life. Look at all the things you're doing right now. Look at all the people, the places, commitments that are currently bringing up fear in your life. And ask yourself, do you feel good after these interactions? Do you feel good when you see that person? Do you feel good when you go to that place? Do you feel good when you honor that commitment? And if the answer is yes, keep them. And if not, maybe it's time to let go, to make room for more meaningful people and experiences, to make room for more healthy experiences. Just remember that you are in control here. You are the one with the power. Your fear will try to convince you that it's the one in control, that you're just in the passenger seat, forced to ride everything out, do whatever you have to do. But that's not true. It might have been true at some point in your life. There were definitely many moments where I was passenger to the chaos around me, to the heartache around me. But that doesn't mean it's true now. So just keep reminding yourself that you're the one in control. You have the power to do whatever you want. And you're smart enough to figure out if something is good for you or not good for you. But you can only do that if you're brave enough to look at your fears, to challenge your fears, to question your fears, to put them in perspective, and to figure out which of them are helping you pushing you to be stronger and braver, and which of them no longer serve you, which of them you need to overcome. And that concludes this week's episode. As always, it's my sincerest wish that you found something useful to take with you out into the world today. And next week, I'll be back to talk about gratitude and why sometimes it feels like a bunch of bullshit. But until then, please take good care of yourself, and thank you so much for listening. This episode of A Well-Cared-For Human was written and produced by me, Corey Marie. The music was by Late Night Feeler and Esther Abrami. If you like what I'm doing here, please consider visiting my Patreon. For as little as a dollar a month, you get early ad-free access to the episodes, as well as a monthly patrons-only Q&A, bonus videos, and more. Not to mention that your Patreon support lets me know that you find value in the show and want it to continue. You can find me on Patreon by visiting www.patreon.com forward slash Corey Marie. If you can't support the show financially, that is okay. You can still subscribe to the show, leave a review of the show, and recommend the show to your friends, not just the neurotic ones. All of this helps so much. And as always, thank you for listening.